Uh, something that I know just from kind of interacting with people and living on this earth, um, and I think you, you probably know it too intrinsically, uh, as much as we can think that uh, the culture and the people in the culture who are not yet Christians are adamantly opposed to God and his ways, I think it's easy to think that because we can watch the news, we can see how different our culture is now than it was 20 years ago, 40 years ago, 60 years ago. It's easy to think that because you can see culture at large uh, doing things that are much more, what I would say, destructive than they used to be. I still believe that at the heart level and at the human level that most people want God to be real, they want him to be good, and when they get in a pinch, they are calling on that spiritual being who lives in the skies to come in and affect their life. I think most people want God to be real, need, not say want, need him to be real. And in fact, they want him to actually intervene in their lives and adjust and move. And, and if they knew that the God that we talk about was actually real, they would come running to him. The problem is, is I think most of us uh, have been trained to engage with God as if he is a concept and an idea and not live with him as if he is a reality. And so I, it's kind of where I want to go today because like I said earlier, uh, there, there, are, there are four things that we really want to see in the life of this church. We want you to encounter God. We want you to connect with family. And then as you connect with family, we want you to actually grow in your relationship to Jesus and not just grow relationally. We want you to be transformed into the likeness of Jesus. We want you to become like him. We want you to be righteous like he is, holy like he is, powerful like he is, and free like he is. We want you to be transformed in the image of Jesus. If you look at the life of Jesus in the Gospels, it, it should be that we are growing more and more like that person. Um, that, that's the idea here. It's not to listen to sermons together. It's not just to sing songs together. It's not just to have friends in here who believe what we believe. But it's actually to get rid of the things in our life, the compromise in our life. The things in our life that take us away from all the fullness of what he has for us and to grow in him. And then finally, the fourth piece which we're talking about today uh, is that we would not just stop in our own growth in the Lord, but we would carry the kingdom of God into the places that we go. And so I want to adjust paradigm today is really what I want to do, and I want to do it in a really short amount of time. In a really short amount. I know y'all are worried. Y'all are like, it's 1130 and he's just now getting started. I know. I know. I see worry in your eyes. I see it. Yeah, you're concerned. It's a legitimate concern. It's a legitimate concern. <laughs> um, but here's the paradigm that I want to adjust. Uh, and it's, it's simple. The church, the body of Christ, does not have a responsibility to make more Christians. Okay. So, so if you think in your mind, what does it mean to carry the kingdom? Uh, and, and our church is going is to talk about this in a really particular way. Um, our responsibility is not to make more Christians, right? So that's, that's not our job. If we get to do that, awesome, okay? But that's not our job. And I want to show you what our job is. Uh, our church has a responsibility not to create more Christian. Our church has a responsibility to tear down the gates of hell. That's what the responsibility of the church is, okay? Let me show you real quick. Matthew 16, um, and, and we've talked about this a little bit, but I want to spend some time on it for a second. Uh, there is a, uh, a moment where Jesus takes uh, his, a few of his disciples. He goes to this place called Caesarea Philippi, and he asks them, who do people say that I am? Uh, and some of them say, well, some say that you're Elijah, the prophet who's come back to life. Um, some people say this, some people say that. And then Peter pipes up and he says, you are the Christ or, or in another language in Hebrew, the Messiah. So you're the one who's come to set all things right. You're the one who has come to deliver humanity and Israel. You're the one who has come to set everything right though, fundamentally to right all the wrongs, not just to judge, but to fix. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus looks at Peter and he says, Flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. My Father in heaven revealed this to you. You're right. That's exactly who I am. I am the Christ. I'm the Son of the living God. And then he says these words to him. And incidentally, this is the first time the word church is used in the New Testament. 
Uh, and it's one of the only times that the word is used by Jesus himself. Uh, and he says this, I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church. And my church will try to convince everybody that God is real. Right? My church will try to convince everybody that evolution is wrong and that, uh, that young earth creation is, is right. Uh, my church will try to turn other people into Chris Christians using apologetics and, and well-crafted arguments. None of those is what it says, right? My church, on this rock I'll build my church. And he doesn't just say what the church is supposed to do. He says what the church will actually do. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So if in your mind the gates of hell is primarily uh, the gates that protect the lake of fire where God's going to send human beings to, that's not what's in reference here. What's in reference here is that hell has invaded earth and that earth is no longer at this point the kingdom of God. It's no longer God ruling earth and things happening on the earth the way that God would have them happen on the earth. Rather, the earth is ruled by the prince of darkness, a spiritual being who hates humans and wants to manipulate humans to bring about darkness on the face of the earth because he wants to mar the image of God because human beings existed on the earth when they were created to reflect the image of God, to essentially be God's stewards on the earth. And a spiritual being came in to mar that image and twist that image in hatred for God to twist his image on the earth and to get in the way of what God wants to happen on the earth. Does that mean that God is not sovereign and can't do anything he wants? No, God is sovereign and can do absolutely anything that he wants. But what he chose to do was to create a place called earth to hand it over to human beings and their choices on that planet matter. And a spiritual being named Satan, along with demons, have come in to twist human beings and to make them tools of himself instead of tools of God. Does that make sense? Follow me 100% with me, right? And so when he says the gates of hell won't prevail against it, what he means is that the church is being established by that acknowledgement of Peter and that in that acknowledgement, one guy is going to turn into three guys, which is going to turn into 3,000 people, which is going to eventually influence the entirety of the earth in line with the kingdom of God. And so the gates of hell, the places where darkness is established inside of institutions, inside of homes, inside of governments, inside of everything, Jesus is going to push all of that out using his church. So the establishment of darkness on the earth will not prevail against the church moving against it. Does that make sense? So poverty won't prevail against the church moving against it. Sexual abuse won't prevail against the church moving against it, right? Broken families won't prevail against the church moving against it. And it's not the church as an institution, it's the church as human beings who follow Jesus. Because what is the church? The church is not fundamentally an institution or an, or an, or an organization. The church is just human beings who follow Jesus. So in that fourth piece of the puzzle, when I say we carry the kingdom, that I'm, trying to, I'm trying to change that your job is to go into your workplace and trying to convince people mentally or, or theoretically that God exists and they should do what he says. That's not fundamentally it. That can be a part of this puzzle, but if you start there, you lose it. The, what we're supposed to be doing is going in and displacing darkness wherever we happen to be. What do I mean by displacing darkness? That's what I mean by pushing the gates of hell backwards. Let's say that in another way. Displace darkness, or let's put it another way, to carry the kingdom of God and to establish it in, in the space where the kingdom of darkness used to exist. Where the gates of hell used to be here, we're saying, nah, bro, you got to push back a little bit, okay? So where the gates of hell are established in our kids, we've got to push that back a little bit. Where the gates of hell are established in our homes, in our workplaces, in the, in the classes that we go into, we are pushing that back. But we're doing that in a really particular way. We're doing it in the way that Jesus did. We're not doing that by aggression, violence, and argumentation. We're doing that by carrying the way of the kingdom of light forward. So he says, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The responsibility and the joy and the meaning that we have as followers of Jesus is not fundamentally to convince other people to join our religion. 
Rather, it's to displace the kingdom of darkness with the kingdom of light. And that's why the next verse says this to Peter and to those uh, who will come after Peter and have that same declaration of faith in Jesus. He says, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. He's saying, I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven because he's saying it's your responsibility. Right? It's not just, God, I hope you make this place better. Well, you said all things right. We do pray that. But then the question is, is what role do I play in setting all things right? Because the keys of the kingdom of heaven were given to you. They are given to the church. So the keys of the kingdom of heaven, uh, I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Right? I want to jump into what does that mean, and I want to go to a parable about the kingdom of heaven to look at that. Um, so, but what I need you to grab from that statement real quickly is it's not that some, it's not, this is not something that God is doing apart from you. It's something that God is doing through you, if you'll allow it. So we carry the kingdom because we are the ones who have responsibility to bring light and displace darkness. I want us to get real practical in a short time about what it looks like to, to, to do that. Because it's actually more simple than you might imagine. And I want to give us a few handles, and then I want you to see how expansive that can be. Uh, if you'll do this, let's go to uh, Matthew 18. We're going to go just two verses further uh, into Matthew 18, verses 23 to 25. Uh, and I want to take this parable, which is about forgiveness, but it is, that, that is just a great example of one of the ways that we displace darkness. It's not the only way, and this is not just a teaching on forgiveness. It is about forgiveness, but forgiveness is one of these really, really easy, awesome ways where darkness gets displaced. And then you can kind of see that as a viewpoint for other ways to displace darkness in your own heart, in the lives of your family, everywhere you go. Okay, so follow me here for a minute. Uh, and so Jesus tells this parable. It's in Matthew 18, uh, in verse 23. He says this, Therefore, the kingdom of heaven, not the religion of Christianity. When Jesus is going to talk, he's going to talk about the establishment of the kingdom of heaven uh, on the earth. That's what he's up to. The kingdom of heaven can be compared to this. It's like a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. And when he began to settle, there was one who was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. This is more than you can make in several lifetimes. I don't know how he spent that much money. This is like billions, okay? This is more than you can make in several lifetimes. Uh, a man was brought to him owed 10,000 talents, and since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had so that a payment could be made. And then the servant falls on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me, and I'll pay you everything. And now notice what the master does. He doesn't say, okay, I'll be patient, and I'll give you time to pay me back. He can't pay him back. He doesn't have enough lifetimes to pay him back. But when that same servant went out, I'm sorry, sorry, I got ahead. Um, and out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. Okay. So more than you can repay has been forgiven, right? Um, but let's keep going here. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. That is about a hundred days wages. One guy's been forgiven. He's just been forgiven of several lifetimes worth of debt. And then now he's going to find another servant. After he's been forgiven, he's going to find another servant who owes him a pretty decent bit. Okay, a hundred days wages, that's pretty, I mean, that's some cash, right? It's not like it's, it's, it's not minimal, all right? Think about how much you make in a, about a third of the year, that, you know, let's say a third of the year or 30% of the year, how much money do you make and somebody owes you that? This is like significant. Are you going to go like break kneecaps? Right, where my money? He owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him, he began to choke him. <laughs> when Jesus puts it this way, it makes it sound silly. <laughs> Pay what you owe. And so his fellow servant fell down, did the same thing he did. He pleaded with him, have patience with me and I'll pay you. And he refused, and he put him in prison until he should pay the debt. So this is where it gets interesting. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed 
And they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and he said to him, you're a wicked servant. I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in his anger, so now the master is angry. His master delivered him to the jailers till he should pay all his debt. Okay, so one, there's an obvious place that this, this, this text is talking about. You have been forgiven by Jesus, by Jesus' own sacrifice. He didn't just let you off the hook. He actually paid the debt for you. He gave his life for you. He was, he was brutally like crucified for you. Uh, knowing everything that you would do, uh, he, he willingly did that. Knowing everything that the church would do, he willingly did that. Knowing everything that humans would do, he willingly did that. So he forgave a debt that you couldn't pay. And so now he's saying, because you have received forgiveness from me, okay, so because you have received a forgiveness, from, so let's talk about this for a minute, just for a second. There was a day whenever I, in my room, in the middle of, uh, in, in the middle of trying to figure out, like, my life, and my life having fallen apart, there was a day that I, like, I remembered, I've done so much to screw my family over, I've done so much to squander the gifts that my parents have given me, I've done so much to waste time, and to engage in, like, all these different drugs, and to do all these different things, and to, to go to jail so many times, and I, I'm in my room, and I'm like, I get it, like, I, I've, I've been a complete idiot, like, what have I wasted? How much time have I wasted? How much, like, how much of my life, of this gift of my life, I've wasted? Do you know what I mean? Like, I've just wasted it. And, 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 and in that moment, I hear, not audibly, but in my head, don't you know that's what Jesus was for? Don't you know that's what Jesus was for? And in that moment, I submit my life to Jesus. Right there, like in, in, in my room, my friends are like downstairs getting high, and I'm upstairs in my room with the door locked, and I'm like, Jesus, like Jesus I, I get it now, and I'm sorry. And so I receive forgiveness from him. And, and as many of you know, like, there were addictions that stopped that week. There was like several different addictions that stopped that week. There was so much of turmoil and anxiety and frustration and hardness that stopped that week because the forgiveness of Jesus displaced darkness that was having room in me. Right? I had made agreement with addictions. I had made agreements with lifestyle. I would made agreements with the way that I was going to go after women. I would made agreements with the way that I was going to. And in making agreements, in, and when I say agreements, I had said yes to the worldly values that said this is what you should do. This is what you ought to do. This is how to feel valuable. This is how to get liked by people. This is how to have fun and feel alive. I said yes to those values and did those things, and I made a home for spiritual beings. I made a home for demons inside of me. Does that make sense? The forgiveness of Jesus displaced that in me. When I said that is wrong, I rejected the way that the world set up value systems. I rejected those value systems, and I said, I don't want that. I received the blood of Jesus over it. So now all the accusations that those spiritual beings make against me to God the Father are canceled and nullified because Jesus died to cover them, right? So the accusations that come against me are nullified. They don't matter anymore. They're like, no, it doesn't matter anymore. It's not that what I did was right or wrong. It's that they, like, that's been covered. It's been covered by the blood of Jesus. So the receipt of forgiveness displaced, it made no room for darkness in me in that way anymore. Does that mean I became perfect that day? No, but there were very specific things that ended that week, very specific things. So it displaced, it made it, made it to where darkness couldn't have a home in me in some very particular ways. Okay, so I received the beauty of forgiveness. Like, oh my gosh, what a beautiful thing. I know the sweetness of it. I know what it feels like to have the creator and the judge of all creation look at me and say, it's okay, it's okay. I've already made, I've already made like arrangements for that. It's okay. I know how freeing that is. I know how it adjusted things in me. Therefore, when people sin against me, when people sin against you, you know the sweetness of it. You know the way that it displaces. So imagine those those angry conflicts that you get into your, with your spouse. You know what I'm saying? And your spouse does things to you. And you're like, that's wrong. Like, I can't believe you spoke to me that way. I can't believe you said that to me. Or take your friends who treat you like crap sometimes, right? 
and they just, they roll over you, you know what I mean? And, and they, they like do things that are a sin against you. Do you know I mean? I'm not just saying they offend you, they sin against you. People sin against you. They owe you a debt, they've sinned against you. Do, do you know the beauty and the, the, the wonder and the life that comes whenever that person comes to you and they're like, man, I, I really am, I'm so sorry, I should not have done to, that to you. Do you know that little voice in you that's like, it's just weird, right? Do you know how when we're wronged, we feel right? And when we pick up anger, we feel powerful? You know what I'm saying? And that when you say, it's okay, I forgive you, you're like letting go of power. Do you know what I'm saying? You're letting go of the ability to use that against them. Do you know what I'm saying? You're letting go of the ability to say, you were wrong and I was right and I like feeling right. Do you know what I'm saying? So there is, there is this way that the forgiveness that we apply to somebody else, when we say to them, it's okay, I forgive you and I don't hold it against you, that they get to experience in themselves the same thing that you got to experience and that I got to experience when I received the forgiveness of Jesus. And do you see that in this story that God is angered, the master is angered, when, not when you don't receive forgiveness. He is angered when you don't extend the same forgiveness that you've received. Do you see that? And this just isn't about forgiveness, though. Because the reality is, is you've been given the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, it is your job to give all that you've received. The same sort of anger resides in the heart of, father, of the master whenever he provides financially for us. And then we withhold our finances out of fear. And we don't give what we've been freely given. Does that make sense? And this is not me telling you to give to the church, okay? You should, but this is not what this is about. Because <laughs> that'd be super self-serving. But do you see what I mean? We are, we are here not just to receive from God, but to carry the liberating things that he gives us forward into the relationships that we have and into the places that we have. So that when I withhold out of fear what I've been freely given, I am communicating back to the master something about what I've been given. Our job is to displace darkness, to carry the kingdom of God, and to carry the light and the goodness of God into places that have darkness in them. I want to give you another example. Do you know the way that whenever you, um, you, you know when you like, you actually do something wrong and your kids see it? You know, you know, I'm talking, some of y'all have kids and you know, you, you've actually done something wrong and your kids saw it. And you know how kids are vocal about it? You know what I mean? Yeah. And they, and they, 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 and let's just not say you, you've done something wrong. Let's, you've done something wrong against them. Okay. You just did to them something that you've told them never to do. Let's, let's just say you got angry and you cussed at your kids. Let's just go, let's get specific. Okay. Uh huh. I know. I see some of y'all are like, ugh. Uh huh. You got angry and you like, <laughs> you, you drop one on them. Do you know what I'm saying? Okay, I need, you to, I need you to hear me on this real quick. If you are doing something that you're telling your kids not to do, and they recognize it and call you on it, okay, you have, you have an opportunity. You have an opportunity to either displace darkness, or you have an opportunity to protect darkness and entrench darkness. And let me show you what I mean. When you refuse to acknowledge and refuse to repent and refuse to acknowledge to your child, even though I'm the father and even though I'm the authority figure, I did something wrong and I need your forgiveness. When you refuse to do that, what you're communicating to that kid without communicating to that kid is, is this. You are not valuable enough to acknowledge my wrongs to. You are not human enough to acknowledge my wrongs to, which means I can sin against you and you have no recourse because I'm bigger, I'm stronger, I'm louder, and you have no value. You didn't know you were communicating that when you don't repent to your kids, but that's what you're communicating. 
You're communicating, I demand you do things. I don't have to do those things. You can't bring a charge against me. You have nowhere to go, and you have nowhere to go because you have no value. Because I'm more human than you. I'm more powerful than you. I'm stronger than you. My voice is more important than yours. So when I say you entrench darkness, I'm not just saying, like, you teach them to cuss. That is not what I'm saying, all right? They're going to learn that at school, okay? Sorry. Yeah, it's, all right. it's too late. If your kids are four, it's too late. <laughs> what I mean is you communicate valuelessness that they will operate from later on in one of two ways. They will either rebel against that system that's broken that you are creating or they'll actually agree with that broken system, which is actually worse. And their agreement with that system would be that I have no value. I'm not worth standing up for. I'll go find somebody else who mistreats me because I know what that looks like to be mistreated and not be valued. You'll find them married to someone later on in life who doesn't know how to treat them and they won't stand up against it because they've been trained from early on that they don't have value. So they don't operate as if they have value. They don't make choices as if their bodies are valuable. They make choices as if their bodies are not valuable because we communicated to them, you're not valuable. You follow what I'm, you follow what I'm saying? So when I say displaced darkness, I mean it's super simple and it's very, very subtle and it's, and it's really powerful. My job as a follower of Jesus is to walk like Jesus and to not allow the compromise of darkness to occupy any place in me so that when I interact with other human beings, I don't let the compromise of darkness occupy a space in them. So it, just in a simple way, my kid calls me on it. Or maybe my kid doesn't even call me on it, but I, I can hear it in here. I'm going to them. Hey, dad did this. Dad should not have done this. That is not the way you should be treated. You are more valuable than that, and I repent. Will you forgive me? Do you see that? Okay. That's just one of a thousand ways. Imagine that in an employee-employer relationship. Imagine that between a husband and a spouse. Imagine that between just your, your, the teacher that you don't like at school because they're always degrading Christianity. Imagine things like that where you act to Jesus or you act as Jesus to other people. That's precisely what I mean. Our job is to displace darkness in all of the areas that we have the ability to displace darkness. So when we talk about prophecy in here and we're asking God to reveal his heart to us for another person, when we're saying things like, God, I see this other person and I, I, my heart just kind of yearns for them and I don't even know them. And I'm asking God, hey, will you just share with me your heart towards them? Like, how do you feel towards them? What do you think? Sometimes it goes well. Sometimes nothing happens. But there are these occasions where I feel like an overwhelming love or even get some sort of words for that person. The heart, the heart or the idea behind it is that I'm going to that person even though it's risky and even though it feels scary so that I can share with them how God the Father feels towards them to displace the darkness of how they feel towards themselves. You know, many people carry darkness about how they feel about themselves every single place that they go. They feel like they're worthless because they don't look like people on Instagram. They feel like they're not valuable because they've been raised in homes that did not treat them as if they were valuable. Right? They've been raised in environments that were performance-driven, and they're not living up to the performance at the moment. And since they're not living up to their performance at the moment, they feel like garbage. And so carrying the heart of God the Father and saying, God, will you just, I just want to go encourage that person. Will you share with me your heart? You're going in to just say, hey, I just want you to know that, like, regardless of how you feel about you today, Father in heaven, like, really loves you. Like, he really cares. He really loves me. And I felt like he wanted me to tell you this. Do you see how that displaces darkness? You don't even have to be like, I got this prophetic word, right? Like, don't, maybe, maybe don't do that. Yeah. When we talk about blessing in this church, what we mean is precisely that same thing, that you're having lunch and your waiter's there. And do you know that waiters don't get treated super well in Nacogdoches? <laughs> Waitresses don't, right? So it's okay to stop that transactional moment that's going on between you and somebody who's there to serve you and to say to them, Hey, can I just like bless you in the name of Jesus? And I, maybe actually bless him with a decent tip. But then also, 
hey, can I just bless you in the name of Jesus that our Father in heaven, like, he, he loves, he cares, and he has good things for your life. Like, he has good things for your life. And so I bless your life, and I bless this shift that it goes well, that the people you work with treat you well. Do you know what I mean? This is not huge, but it is. I'm conveying the heart of God the Father, which is life and light and love, and I'm conveying it so that it displaces just a little bit of darkness. Do you realize how much currency you get when you just displace a little bit of darkness in the life of another person by blessing them, conveying the heart of God the Father to them, forgiving them or receiving their forgiveness that they provide, or telling them you were wrong, or just saying when they're wrong, it's okay. When you displace darkness, do you realize how much currency you have to actually talk about the gospel of Jesus after that? It's nuts. It's nuts. So when we say that that fourth bit of what it looks like to kind of walk as Mosaic Church and be a part of Mosaic Church, that fourth bit is actually the most important bit. Because that's the place that we actually take the will of our Father who is in heaven and make it what's happening in Nacogdoches. That in Nac, as in heaven, happens that way. In your home, at work, with your spouse, with your kids, with your friends. Um, it's the heart behind ministry. It's the heart behind parenting. It's the heart behind friendship. It's the heart behind every human relationship and interaction. Because in every single one of those interactions, you have the ability to carry the kingdom of God into it, whether or not you got to explain Jesus is the son of God who forgives sins. Does that make sense? And what you'll find is if your heart is to carry the kingdom of light and life if, you do, if you're just eyes open towards it, what you're going to find in many, many, many cases is you actually do get to do that other bit, right? Because people actually care what you have to say once you've conveyed the light and life and goodness of the kingdom of light when all they feel in many cases is the darkness and the darkness is actually what's driving them towards the light in many cases. That's why most people desperately want God to be real because life is so dark. That's why they desperately want God to move because life has gotten so hard. That's why they desperately want God to be real is because they need a real God to interface with the real power of darkness that they find themselves under. And that is us. That is us. We've been given the keys to the kingdom of heaven to bind and loose, to displace darkness, and to bring about life and light. Yeah. Woo! Um. I want to pray. Uh, I don't know that we got time for worship today, but I do want to pray. Uh, so if you'll stand up, let's do that. So if you would, two things as we pray. Um, I just want to pray for you, but I kind of want you to have a moment where you're interacting with God as well. Are there places in you where darkness is not displaced? Question one. You can't carry the kingdom where you don't have the kingdom. You may be forgiven by Jesus for your sins, but there may be places where you don't walk in the authority of Jesus, and so compromise has a spot. You're given to rage, you're given to anger, you're given to alcoholism, you're given over to things. Is there a place, is there a place where darkness still abides in you? It's a legitimate question without, without shame or accusation tied to it. It's just the invitation of God our Father is to deal with it. And so where is it that darkness still resides? And it can be subtle, right? It doesn't have to be huge. I get lazy when I get home because the day is hard. And so I agree with sort of a victim mindset that I'm not strong enough to be present for my kids after a hard day's work. It's darkness, right? It's darkness. But where does darkness still abide in you? And so as that comes to mind, as the Holy Spirit, would you reveal? Would you just reveal? We trust that your revelations are good. We trust that what you do, Holy Spirit, inside the hearts of human beings is to liberate. We trust you. And I can't, maybe if you can't put a name to it, but you can recognize, ah, it's just not, it's not like Jesus there. I mean, it's not like Jesus there. I 
like when I try to teach my oldest son how to be a goalie. This is not like Jesus. It doesn't come out like Jesus would. I'm just, I'm just giving that to you right now, Father. I'm softening my heart in front of you, God. There's a place of darkness residing there. I want to be done with it. Would you show me why my flesh is vulnerable there? Would you show me what worldly values I've agreed to that are not the values of your kingdom? I repent of using anger. I repent of using frustration. I repent of selfishness. I repent of using addictions to cover wounds, right? Where is that? just want to be done with it. So we're just opening. We may not be able to, to dig it all out today, but just softening my heart towards you, Lord, that I won't protect that anymore. And then I'm allowing you to start to deal with it. I'm allowing you to start to deal with it. So as much as I can understand of it, I repent of it and don't want it. And so Holy Spirit, we're asking you and I'm asking you in the name of Jesus that you would begin to invade and that you'd begin to fill and that you'd begin to speak and that you'd begin to address those places in the hearts of the people in this room. And then second thing, Lord, would you give revelation now into the places of light and life that you have brought in the hearts and the minds of the people in this room right now? Where have you delivered? Where have you set free? Where have you met and engaged? Where have you provided? Where have you been good to the people in this room in such a way that it's displaced darkness in their life? Where are those things? And so, God, we want to know what those things are. And, and Jesus, we're asking that you would, by your spirit, you would give us eyes to see when we can walk in that same thing with another person. Where can I bring some of that into the relationship that I have with another person? Confidence of your healing, where can I bring that? Confidence of your provision, where can I bring that? Confidence of your deliverance, where can I bring that? Confidence of forgiveness, And so we, as a church, we just tell you right now, Father, that we uh, want to walk in all of the ways of the kingdom that you have for us and that we're willing to soften our hearts and allow you to do that. We're also willing to open our eyes to the ways that we have been given to carry your kingdom forward. Would you show us the opportunities so that we can be faithful to walk in them with people that we know really well and with people that we haven't met yet and we just get a quick moment with? God, we're asking that you would give us revelation in those moments and we soften our hearts to be able to be people who do that. Not committed to our own ends, not committed to our own agendas, not committed to all the things that we have to do, but but that we will seek first your kingdom. Seek first the, the, the advance of your kingdom in the specific ways that you've given us to do. So we're just letting you know, Father, that's what we want. We're just letting you know that's who we want to be and that we trust you over that. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen.